So, Pedro, tell us a little bit about your background and what you write about. Uh, Well, uh, I have no business writing about most things I write about, but uh, my my background is just uh, just journalism. I mean, I just I I like to take up things that are, I think, kind of taboo and uh, engage with them in um, in a serious way. Um, Yeah, I mean, that's really it. I I Mm. I don't have any kind of like professional or credential background in this stuff, which. I think it's, in some ways it's good um, because I, I, I can come into issues without blinders mm-hmm. um, and, and kind of take an outsider perspective to things. So that's really it. Yeah. Well, fair enough. Um, and how did you start to get into the culture wars? What I mean, because with a lot of people, there's something that sparked it. Uh, with me, yeah. for example, there was as well. So yeah, what what was it? Uh, man, you said well, you said a little bit about myself. There's there's no there's no easy answer to these questions. Um, I, I, I grew up in San Diego, California, so I grew up as a kind of just, you know, a lib, uh, just someone who just kind of imbibed liberalism as a kind of the ambient stuff and, and the, in the environment. Right. And, um, it was really the election of, of Donald Trump that made me kind of rethink a lot of things. Uh, I think a, a, a flash point for me was I realized that there was a kind of convergence in the way that Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump were talking about the elites talking about uh, the ruling class, talking even about issues like immigration, they actually, at least initially, uh, had very similar outlooks on immigration. Um, obviously that changed, but that was really uh, kind of my my moment where I you know, started, became politically aware of things, started questioning my own beliefs. And um, my movement to the right was, um, it was pushed along actually by engaging with Buchanan era culture war uh, lore, basically, like reading these, because I mean, there's nothing new under the sun, right? And a lot of the things that we're seeing today were actually debated in the 80s and 90s um, at the at the peak of the Buchanan movement. And so, I mean, for a lot of people, they saw Trumpism uh, and, and also similar movements around the world is kind of reminiscent of, of these, these debates that we had and we thought were lost and settled, but Obviously, they weren't. Uh, they've been revived, and, and the fights are as pitched as ever. So, is there room for uh, the center ground? C- can you can one criticize both Trump and Bernie Sanders as populists? Yeah. Both, you know, as you say, one of the same or coin, two sides of the same coin. Criticism of populism is different from. You don't have to be a centrist to criticize uh, populism. I think and I, I'm I'm critical of populism in the sense that I don't I don't view populism as viable as as a populism as an end unto itself. You're you're talking about a kind of directionless rolling revolution that is you know basically just exists to uh, satisfy popular anger, uh, but it has no real telos, right? It has no direction, no vision of where it wants to go. It's just kind of like rolling thunder. Um, as far as like, is it possible to be a centrist? I don't think so. I um, there's a saying that I, I don't know if you've, you've heard it, but we, you hear it over and over again here in the United States, which is that basically the side that wants to be left alone is always going to be defeated and imposed upon by the side that wants to rule. And so basically, if you're a centrist and your position is, I just want to be left alone, well, it, you don't have to worry about me. I'm, I'm on the right. I don't have any power. It's it's the people with institutional power who are, who are going to force you to use you know little things that are actually in, in some ways like petty tyrannies like pronouns referring to illegal aliens as undocumented Americans uh, you know and and not being able to dissent from consensus on policy like uh, the the nature of the war in Ukraine and whether or not your country should be unflinchingly devoted to pledging support to them you know so um, I don't what's I don't wrong? think it's possible. Awesome. What what's wrong with um uh saying un, un, undocumented was what was it undocumented immigrants yeah yeah undocumented americans because you're, you're suggesting essentially that that citizenship no longer really matters no longer matters that if people come here illegally and do things the right way and actually uh come here for more than just economic reasons right uh to, to take advantage of something it, it when you start to say that people who cross the border are americans mm. then the the essence of being an american essentially evaporates if everyone can be, you know, X, Y, Z nationality, then there, that nationality ceases to exist. And you're ultimately just talking about countries as kind of economic zones as like open air flea markets. And and why is that necessarily 
a problem uh why does it why does it matter it does that uh, i share some of those feelings as well and then i uh, you know, I've got these two things in my mind at once all the time. And the other part of me is, is saying, well, that's that's the tribal urge kicking in. And that's the, yeah. uh, you know, they, they they talk about, for example, um, or oh, the amygdala or the amygdala that you can you can sort of use magnets to turn that off. And when you do, people tend to be uh, less fearful of immigration and fearful of other people coming in and and, and that kind of thing. So is that that maybe that tribal side of hey this is this is my thing and it's important and so people need to you know they can't just come in here and be us i think there's an interesting aspect to what you just said that basically the only way to to make people think differently is is through artificial means you have to use magnets <laughs> you have to use some like industrial yeah. uh solution to to alter human nature and it can only be altered for as long as there's a, ma a magnet connected to that i mean that tells you something that tells you that to an extent, tribalism is inevitable. You, you, we think of tribalism as kind of like, um, you know, black versus white or whatever. But aren't you? Do you have a family? Yeah, well, uh, not my own kids, but okay. parents and sure. wife, sort of. Thing. Well, I'm I'm a I'm a father of two. Um, mm -hmm. When you're you're tribal about your own family, your family is not everyone's property, and neither is your home. And and so I think there there are kind of circles of tribalism that that get larger and larger and larger right and and we ultimately determine what those circles are um and i think that when you have this kind of uh this this cohesion this breakdown of cohesion as a result of mass immigration there, there's a kind of paradox here right because the argument is well mass immigration is good because it overcomes tribalism i actually think that it has the opposite effect if if basically if cohesion breaks down as a result of of immigration, what it means to be an American, right? If that can no longer be concretely defined, the response is that people are actually going to retreat into other identities, as opposed yeah. to being an American, you're an Arab living in Britain. Uh, you, you're uh, you know, an African nationalist in America, which no longer represents you because it's racist. You're, you're a Chicano or you know, you're a, a Latinx living in, in the United States. It actually has the opposite effect. It increases the, the worst kinds of tribalism just more little bits of tribalism. So tribalism is going to get its way anyway, but it might as well it might as well represent or, or help to um, enforce an entire nation and bring them together. Is what is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, ult ultimately, uh, when we're talking about tribalism. Like I said, I think it's inevitable, and we're talking about communities. Mm -hmm. um, and you can have. Uh, I think there are forms of identity that are less destructive than others. And, and ultimately, I think, the, again, the paradox of immigration, the open society is that it actually encourages, you know, what we often refer to as balkanization. Uh, it, it makes that kind of inevitable because I mean, you, you basically, imp it's not like you import a bunch of people and everyone agrees, okay, we're in the same economic zone now, we're going to live together. Uh, you, you actually just often Im import these, these conflicts. I mean, there, there are, I've been seeing reports of a lot of like street fights between like uh, different ethnic groups in the UK right now, right? I mean, that, I mean, that's kind of an example of what I'm talking about. Those things did not go away because everyone's allowed to own a shop now. Hmm. Well, yeah, I still think I still think tribalism, while it obviously has its perks and its positives, it, it also stops us thinking logically in, in some senses. And of course, I talked about those magnets as an artificial way of of, of reducing the fear, um, but that makes us think more rationally, I, I suppose. So I'd, I guess I'd still be wary of, of some of that tribalism. I think there are other ways, of course. I mean, I remember interviewing uh, the, the terrorist who um, created the uh, Jesse Morton, who created he did the ingredients for the recipe for the marathon bomb in Boston. Uh, and he later worked to sort of talk people down. And he always spoke about how it was a long process, but it helped that he was like an in, someone on the inside being able to talk people down. So that would be the non-artificial way to change how somebody thinks. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, like I said, um, I'm not, so, I'm not like someone who thinks that conflict, um, I think that conflict to a degree is inevitable, but we obviously should do things to mitigate it and avoid it. Um, and, and again, that's that's really part of my opposition to these things. I think there's there's a, a a mistake that occurs when we have these debates, and someone takes a side of being like a restrictionist against someone who's more leaning towards like the open society. And the assumption is that the restrictionist is somehow he he takes that position because he doesn't like the other. He does, he hates the other, right? Um, that's not that's actually not true at all. And I, I think it's 
it's a desire to avoid these kinds of things, uh, to avoid these like the needless polarization of society along, like I said, the worst kinds of, of, of uh, lines. Um, and I, I don't know, I actually, I actually think, again, I'm not trying to be a contrarian here, but I, I think about identity a lot as someone who's a Mexican American who mm -hmm. doesn't identify with the first, you know, I, I consider myself an American um, and my wife is German. So my kids are Mexican American German. And so I think about identity a lot. Uh, and I, I think that maybe sometimes we don't think about it enough and, and the implications of these things, right? Um, so, yeah. yeah I, take it I, think, I think that is quite a, a contrarian view for somebody who's on the other side to the what we might call the woke ideology to take because my issue with the woke ideology is that they are so obsessed with identities and their Twitter handles are full of, I'm a white, or for you to take your example, Mexican, American, German, I'm these things. Whereas I would want to say as an individualist, I'm somebody who likes singing and I like to read these books and that's what defines yeah. me, not these sort of identities and ancestors. Although there is, there is value in taking from their cultures, but I feel like when we obsess too much about those identities that's where society can whether it's the bolsheviks or you know the nazis and i, I, I don't that, that's always a cheap shot because everyone's always mentioned a nazi i don't mean that anyone who thinks about identity is a nazi or a bolshevik but when society goes too far those ways that's yeah. when they they can they can air yeah no i think look i think i i, I don't i'm using myself because i think maybe this is a, an interesting example but i'm not i'm not saying that mexicans don't like to read but um, I mean, there's an article in the New York Times that talks about like I think the headline is something like the country that stopped reading, and it's about how just as as a as a leisurely activity, uh, Mexicans don't read much. Right, and, and, so, and so, see, so so yeah. so does your son then have to have th that in ingrained in in who, their identity that they don't read? Isn't that no? Statement? I just I just think it's interesting. I I just think it's interesting yeah. that basically like w w culture matters, um, and and individuation which is essentially what you're talking about basically being part of a broader community but then having like individual interests and and proclivities and all that stuff i think that's that's totally fine and natural but i just think again it, it's really interesting because we we just kind of take all these things uh for, for granted we we make we make a lot of assumptions because we kind of uh we don't realize that there are that culture is kind of particular um mm -hmm. so and my son reads a lot by the way he's two years <laughs> old but he he loves he loves books so wait how old uh, is he He's my son is two, and I have an, uh, a nine-month-old daughter. Wow! Yeah. And, and he's he, already he reading. Loves, yeah, he loves books. Uh, but I, we, we, uh, we have like a rule for as long as possible. He's not. Our kids are not allowed to like watch movies or look at screens or interact with electronics. And so their only source of one of their only sources of of like entertainment is I, I read to them a lot. Uh, no. And they like it. They love it because they have no idea that there's, you know, video games and movies and stuff like that. So. <laughs> They'll find out soon enough. So what what are some of the biggest issues that you take with uh, some of the culture wars? And I suppose we're talking again with culture wars. We're talking about one side that wants to sort of police yeah. speech. Um, yeah. is, is that what we're talking about? Yeah. I just saw someone in the comments who said, I know Mexicans that read. I know. I, I know. <laughs> I, you're, you're talking to one. Uh, <laughs> you're yes, you're, you're clearly yeah. very well read. You're, you have um, I try, you're very I try eloquent in your in your in your speech that, that comes from I, reading well thank you i try to be uh I, I mean for me the biggest thing right now is is uh transgenderism um okay and i think that there i i think that there there's a again there's another mistake that occurs i think when we discuss these issues that we dismiss things like this as kind of frivolous um that basically the culture war issues uh we, we take a kind of materialistic perspective which is that basically culture war issues uh, conceal the real war, which is the class war, right? And I actually think that the two are kind of entwined. Uh, I think that the, the the issues are not really, uh, you, you can't separate them as neatly, I think, as people assume. And, but transgenderism for me uh, is is a, uh, it, it's an immense threat because I think it strikes the core of society, which is the family. That you're, you're ultimately not just talking about, you know, goofy people like, you know, Admiral Rachel Levine, of the United States government, who's, you know, obviously doesn't pass for a woman, but everyone is just supposed to, you know, respect that her pronouns and all that stuff. Uh, but I think it's it's actually much much more dangerous than that because ultimately what you're talking about is empowering the state to be able to um, to enforce a way of life that I think is fundamentally destructive. Um, 
I mean, in the United States, where, where you know the latest thing that just happened is that you have these major medical associations petitioning the Department of Justice to basically look in and suppress uh, movements, en entities, and individuals who are um, you know militantly outspoken against uh, transgender ideology and, and the affirmative care model. If that, I mean, you're you're talking about the the federal government and its law enforcement agencies essentially viewing parents showing up to school board meetings uh, as as essentially kind of like terroristic threats, potential terrorists. Man. So I think I think it goes again. It, you it's easy to dismiss these things as kind of frivolous, but it has teeth and it affects the way that you live. Well, how does it, I, I suppose, again, I'm just thinking out loud here, it's, it's that your kids are exposed to this kind of stuff at school. Uh, and I suppose the worrying thing is that some of this stuff was said by people, you know, a couple of decades ago about gay people. When, and now the consensus in society is that, you know, it's fine to be gay and, and all of this stuff. What, what is different this time around? Are you talking about how the gay rights movement is somehow like immune from the problems that are afflicting the transgender rights movement? Well, I, I'm talking about how we've we've sort of, and I, I say most most of society. It's amazing how it happened because only 10, 15 years ago, I think a lot of uh, people were quite outspoken in the mainstream media about being against gay marriage, for example. Oh, I see. Um, now that's completely changed, and and people are sort of you know on board with it. Uh, but, but what the things you're saying about sort of the traditional family and that being lost, um, those things could still apply to homosexuality. I mean, how, how do you feel about homosexuality? Yeah, well, I mean, I actually don't think it's, um, I think that the, the two issues are connected. Um, I mean, in, in some ways, uh, actually in a lot of ways, the gay rights movement was what you would call like a, a tribal movement. It was an ident identitarian movement because it was a movement based around sexual identity. And, um, and I think that, I mean, like we're at this kind of uncomfortable inflection point where you, you see people who are essentially, you know, gay, uh, but that's not their entire identity, uh, who kind of, I think, feel a, a level of discomfort because um, they, they kind of see how the community that they're a part of, it, it maybe shares some of the kind of blame here for paving the road for the, the road for the kind of activism. Um, I think what I think is interesting too, I mean, if you look at like marriage rates among gay people, uh, they're really, really low. So basically, we, we had this kind of revolution where, you know, we, we gave more power to the federal government to enforce non-discrimination. Uh, and, and we kind of changed the way that we look at fundamental institutions like the family and marriage and all that stuff. And in terms of like the, the ostensible goal of these things, which was increasing, uh, uh, enabling gays to get married, didn't really move the needle. I mean, it, it's, it's a really, really small number. Uh, and I think that's, I think that's interesting. No one's really reckoned with that. So, but if you're asking me like, what do I think about, I don't, I don't hate gay people. Uh, but I, I do, uh, like I'm, I'm completely opposed to like the LGBT movement and LGBT ideology, because I think these things, uh, I don't, I don't think you can separate them from, uh, the trans stuff. Um, so mm. yeah, I, I Glenn Greenwald is a fan of mine. What'd you say? I say Glenn Greenwald is a big fan of mine. So isn't that the guy who did the 9-11 documentaries? Yeah. yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Well, there you go. Um, yeah. I, oh, is he gay? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. I see. Yeah, no, fair enough. Um, I, I just remember his name from that 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 film. Um, but yeah, but see, that, that's what I mean, though. Glenn doesn't, like, advertise <laughs> it. You know, he doesn't have a little a flag in his in his bio. I think, I think, look, I mean, obviously the difference is when, when you feel like you've been oppressed for a very long time, you do create these communities, you know, and, uh, and that, that's minorities as well. There are plenty of uh, Mexican American communities in, in the US in particular. There are Jewish communities. There are all sorts of communities where people find mutual ground while fighting against inequality and uh, gay marriage, whether the statistics change, whether people actually wanted gay marriage, I think what they really wanted was to be able to if they wanted to, it's like fighting for the vote. Uh, just because if you fight to have the vote, it doesn't mean you have to vote, and and that if you if you don't, then you've wasted your time. I think the importance is that you're treated as a human being who's who's able to vote. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, this. I mean, I think this is just a point that we would end up just going on disagreement. But I'm, I just don't think that you can mm -hmm. do something so radical 
as redefining an institution uh, as old as marriage and then kind of building an enforcement infrastructure around it uh, and then kind of showing that there's a model for activism to do this. Like, it, it's kind of like, uh, I mean, I don't think the slippery slope is a fallacy, basically. Um, and, and there's a reason why, like, the, the main or a main line of attack against people like me is like, this is just like the fight over gay marriage all over again. It's the mm -hmm. same bigots. It's the same arguments. And yeah. just like that, which, which I wasn't like, saying, but I'm not saying. No, I know I'm you're just, not. I know you're not. But I'm saying this is this is happening regardless. And you know, pe basically, people like me are going to be relegated to the dustbin of history, just like the opponents of same-sex marriage were. And I mean, I, I think e even the the people who um, like the the advocates of this stuff, that is what they're saying, that this is all part of the same movement uh, along mm -hmm. the arc of history. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's. This is one of the reasons why I think this issue is is so difficult. Uh, but also, the, like the stakes are really high. I mean, again, uh, you have these. I mean, I think the United States is actually probably the worst country in this regard. Like, even the UK has. I think they shut down recently, like their biggest gender clinic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Tavistock. Yeah, we we are like slamming the accelerator and going faster. Um, and and more and more, you hear these stories of like you know, kid goes to. I'll give you one really quickly. There was a story about a. Uh, a devout Pakistani Muslim uh, living in Washington and his son had autism. Um, he took his son to the hospital during COVID because his son had a particular, particularly bad episode and I think he hurt himself. So we take him to the hospital and the hospital says, well, you can't stay the night because of COVID. So we'll look after your son and, and let you know uh, what's going on in the morning. So he gets a call and the hospital tells him, so uh, the hospital tells him that they consulted with social workers there and the social workers and the uh, physicians agreed that his son's problem isn't that he's autistic, it's that he's a girl. And the, the father was much, much smarter and level-headed than I would be. And, and he basically, he kind of knew that he had to play along. So he said, like, tell me what I have to do. W you know, tell me where the nearest gender clinics are, what the next step is. Wow. And, and so the hospital released his son. He was so afraid because he knows what happens next. If he would not have gone along with this and the social workers are already involved, this becomes child abuse and you lose control of your kid or you risk losing control of your kid. So basically the father plays along, scoops his son up, takes his family and leaves the state of Washington. And this is happening more and more. And I, like I've interviewed parents who have had similar interactions with social workers. Um, and I, of course you don't, you don't hear about this and it, because it, it totally contradicts the narrative, right? That this is, you know, like a grassroots organic thing that's happening mm. from the bottom up yeah yeah well that that's totally insane i mean but, but the thing is i would say if i'm if i'm honest i mean somebody who's an adult deciding they want to be trans <laughs> and do whatever they want to their body it, it doesn't bother me personally it's even something that if, if i saw that it made them happy i, I would celebrate that and i i totally you know great uh but what where where my it's funny because everybody seems with the I think it's why it catches the imagination so much, the, the the gender fluid stuff, because everybody has something specific to them that that either they agree with or they don't. And for me, just as a journalist, it's just this subversion of truth more than anything else. This idea that we're saying, you know, this woman raped someone, so they're in prison. And it's just like it's not it wasn't a woman that raped someone, you know, it, it's right. just not it's just not true. And that's that's my problem. It was a trans woman, and I'm happy to 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 say that and happy to use pronouns that people want want me to and you know, make people happy and stuff. But uh, yeah, and I agree. I agree with the slippery slope, and I also agree with what you're saying about the, you know, it's very frustrating when the other side of a particular debate says seems to suggest that everything is progress. And I've always, I always say this: the pro one of the problems is that people on the right call people on the left progressives. I don't think that helps. It gives them the idea that they must be progressing uh, towards some sort of goal, and we know from history that that's not that's not how progressive sides or how how history works it goes back and forward all the time um the bolsheviks weren't progressive by our standards you know um what, what are we doing for time oh we're running out of time we just we've talked for ages god this this is this has flown by um was it was this we, we haven't even got to elon musk elon musk talk to me about elon musk quickly he's buying twitter um he's threatening to buy twitter i think the <laughs> i think that the, the uh, the most interesting aspect of the whole Musk saga, because we don't know if he's actually going to pull the trigger, and we also don't know if if his, you know, his his dictatorship at Twitter is going to bring about like meaningful change in the platform. But I think that from the beginning, the interesting thing is what it reveals 
uh, what what this what Elon's kind of like, you know, stepping in it, so to speak, has revealed about Twitter. And I never looked. I personally never looked at Twitter as a, as just a private company. I always kind of viewed it as as a as a tool for creating consensus and and kind of controlling narratives. And Musk attempting to wrest control of the platform really kind of revealed that. You know, like you have heads of state chiming in on why it would be problematic for Musk to take Twitter mm -hmm. and turn it into an actual private company. Like that tells you something about the power of this platform. And I think, and I know we're running out of time, so I'll, I'll leave on this. There was a reporter for NBC News named uh, Ben Collins, and he made a thread where he said that basically losing control of Elon assuming control of Twitter would likely uh, negatively affect um, midterms. That it, it could affect the outcome of elections. Now, it, but in order for that to happen, then you have to already assume that Twitter can and does already have influence over elections, which Collins doesn't deny. He basically says, no, "Right, we we do we do that." We um, and the opposite, if if we lost control of Twitter, would be you know the authoritarianism would win or something like that because opposing viewpoints are illegitimate. But it was just interesting because Collins just really openly says. Twitter has an impact on uh, outcomes and and our control of it and our ability to moderate things, you know, has a salutary effect for our politics in the opposite of their politics, fascism, Nazis, whatever you want to call it. Right. So. It's really fascinating. And I, yeah, I'm sorry. I wanted to ask more about Musk and we've run out of time just because I was enjoying talking to you so much and I could have gone on for mm -hmm. hours. So we'll, we'll have to try and get you back on if you want to come on. But, um, where, yes. where do you want to send people, Pedro, Twitter and all that stuff? So uh, you can follow me on Twitter and almost everywhere else un under the same handle. It's emeriticus, E-M-E-R-I-T-I-C-U-S. And I've got a newsletter at contra.substack.com. Oh, thank you very much, Pedro. And um, have you. a lovely day. Thank you. Hi, I'm Andrew Gold, former BBC journalist. I got a little tired of restrictions over who I could interview and what I could say and do. So I made this channel. Click this playlist here and I'll be seeing you on the edge. 